So good evening and echoing, echoing Sandra and Vicky, thanks so much for being here um, and for sharing this space. Um, I guess I'll just come in just a few, a few, on a few points um, before getting the mic over to um, come for um, the testimony and share um, her story. Um, it's important to, to, to draw the parallels between the state violence occurring in the United States and in Mexico. Um, however, it's just as important to highlight the, uh, the way the state structures are operating um, do have their differences. Um, it's important to recognize that state murders are, are absolutely wrong. But it's also important to recognize that what's happening in Mexico with regards to disappearances is a, is a different piece altogether as well. Um, so, um, but very important, it's, it's important to make those differences. Um, the connections between them, between them and the state violence are racist, state and terrorist state, which we can see in the United States and in Mexico, it's important to, to underscore that as well. Um, so state violence with its parallel state structures um, in Latin America, it, it's a region that's already been ravaged historically. And um, I just wanted to focus a little bit about on the responsibility of the United States. Um, I would say implicitly, but I'd rather say responsibility. Um, through failed U.S. foreign policy historically and currently, uh, we see what's happening to make people uh, Ayotzinapa helped uncover what is really the tip of the iceberg. Uh, ever since uh, America, and even way before that, you know, two billion dollars later, uh, since 2007, 2008, 100,000 deaths later, 50,000, 30,000, who knows, probably more disappearances later, you have a failed war on drugs. Here in the United States, and in Mexico and abroad. Um, we, we, we're talking about Mexico, but you know, this is the same situation in Honduras, especially after the coup in 2009. Um, and different examples of U.S. imperialism abroad coming home to roost. Just last summer, we saw 60,000 unaccompanied minors at the border, most of them from Honduras, for the first time in Sarkia that, that hasn't been the case. And so we like to draw back to the U.S. Uh, back to who in the Honduras in 2009, and we need to call things from the field. Um, and so this is also a space to do that as well. And in talking about making connections, uh, one of the things that we talk about when we talk about, when we listen to the stories uh, of Mexico, is it's not a U.S. foreign policy issue only. U.S. foreign policy is also coming home to When we use tactics that for me, uh, resonate with Cold War national security doctrine and targeting civilian populations as internal enemies as we saw in the case of Ferguson. Uh, it, it at least starts to raise questions on what, what our militarized police is really doing, who is benefiting, who is being protected, who is paying the price. And what's clear is who pays the price in the United States are poor black communities, communities of color, black and brown alike, for working class communities. Same thing in, in Latin America and in, in the case of Mexico. Um, you'll, you'll see through, through the testimonies today that um, those most affected have been historically targeted, historically exploited, historically excluded. And so I'm just close to say, you know, yeah, Mexico is only one example. We, we are here to, to make those connections Hopefully, um, mobilize and have a call to action because this needs to continue. We can't just leave this here uh, this evening. And, uh, you know, here again, we have a militarized police force that's targeting a civilian population. Uh, that is the nature of the state and right now, and it's nothing to stop. And what we need to also have clear is in our call to action, we need to stop exporting a false demand. It's clear that what we have in the United States is not working for anybody except multinationals, the interested elite. More of the same is happening when we export it to countries that also have very, very disproportionate uh, wealth distributions, etc. Uh, many people is a country with uh, enormous amounts of wealth and wealth disparity. And so we, um, we hope that you take that message home tonight. And without further ado, I have the privilege of introducing.
mother of 26 year old Emmanuel Okunga, who murdered by Montgomery County Police Officer Christopher Jordan outside City Place Mall in Silver Spring, just, just here, uh, right outside DC on February 19, 2011, after a dispute with most security guards. Uh, Emmanuel did have a history of mental illness, but neither witnesses nor police alleged that this posed an immediate threat to anyone's safety. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming on to support us. I never thought that would happen to me. Like you said, I'm mean, right here in the zone back here. On February 19, my whole world changed. We have become knocking. And part of this uh, crime was uh, recorded on the video right there. But uh, lack of accountability and uh, transparency in this country that allowed the cops you know, to be racist want to. Now the state are telling me and the prosecutor are going to tell me that somebody mistakenly deleted that video evidence. And for that reason, my case was thrown out of uh, court for lack of uh, evidence. So I really feel the pain of these uh, parents out here today. Even their situation is a little bit, you know, worse that if we are on point, you don't know knock on that door down, you don't know if that's your child. The worst thing any mother can ever go through is to bury your own child, especially if the only crime committed by that child is the color of his skin. I mean, you all know if my son has been a Caucasian or he will be here today because, I mean, 13 eyewitnesses and video, still no accountability. Not all police are bad, but the little ones that you know, the raw elements are giving the good police bad props. Okay, so that's the way I feel. And because of their comrades, the good ones, when they see their fellow police officer committing crime, they are afraid of something, of being bullied or whatever the code may be, that they, are, they just won't come out and tell the truth. So to those of you know good cops out there, I would say if you see something, say something. Because the lack of trust between the community and the police and the law enforcement agency is out of this world. People are even, they don't respect the police anymore and because you can't trust them. And a lot of things have been going on. I've been out here with mothers against police brutality. You know, I went to uh, uh, the 21st century on Obama uh, Tax Force. And, you know, I've been going around. I'm just here for more support because I'm in the pain. It doesn't go away because you know we plan to manage the pain and you know spread the words that it's not I mean it's not your fault that you are black. God knows from regardless of the color of our skin. So my my son did not do anything wrong that day. And for them to say that somebody mistakenly deleted the evidence and you know for that reason. There's no accountability and the cop literally gets away with murder. So, but I'm going to keep pushing until justice is served. No justice, no peace. We need, you know, somebody needs to take a stand. Just like what is going on in Mexico. It's happening here. Every 28 hours, a black skin or brown skin is being murdered by the police in the hands of somebody that was supposed to. So this has to stop. There must be transparency. If uh, there's a cop involved shooting, we need external investigators. By asking, you know, I mean, the grand jury to 
they get their own, they are very biased. They don't, they don't tell the truth. And if the, the police involved shooting, they must test their feet, make sure they are not on drugs or any other you know, alcohol or any, anything. Immediately. Don't give them the 10 days. The 10 days giving them the opportunity to cheat and manipulate and destroy the evidence. Because in this country, every police involved shooting, it takes 10 days for you to file your report as a police officer. God forbid, if you and I kill someone, they will lead us arrive and, you know, call us to jail immediately. You don't have 10 days to answer. So 10 days is not necessary. 10 days or 10 years, the truth doesn't change. So if you kill somebody, you know, do the crime, do the time. You know, you should not care about the law that they are supposed to protect. And there must be transparency. And there must be accountability. So this way, the police can gain the trust of the community that they're supposed to protect. And everybody going to live happy ever after. That's my table read. For the mothers and the mothers for many people, I feel your pain and I'm praying for you. You know, that's all I can say because I mean, you must pray for, uh, for any parent. All your hopes and dreams on that child is not forever, never to be gone. And for not knowing what happened to your child, that's even more painful. But I'm praying. Enjoy the Lord's time. I just say for the Lord's support. Thank you very much.